Welcome to Nonprofit Tech Predictions for 2015. My name is Becky Wiegand, and I'm the Webinar Program Manager here at TechSoup. I'll be your host for today's event, and also joining us are three esteemed presenters that I'm glad to have on the line with us today. The first is TechSoup's very own Jim Lynch, who is the Director of our Green Tech Program and a regular contributor to the TechSoup blog. He is our preeminent technology writer on nonprofit tech news and trends. And so he will be sharing a lot of his predictions today on what, what trends and innovations are likely to impact charities and libraries, and what opportunities are out there for the future. Over his long career at TechSoup, he's been involved in creating TechSoup's environmental programs, including the computer refurbishment and reuse programs here and around the world. So we are glad to have him join us. Also on the line, you will hear from Matt Bauer, who has worked to improve communities in the for-profit and nonprofit sectors for more than 25 years. He's a co-founder of Better World Telecom and Better World Wireless, and he will be joining us to share his predictions, in particular about how mobile technologies and innovations in those mobile uh, devices and mobile access will be uh, changing the way that nonprofits work down the road and what things to look out for there. We'll also be hearing from TechSoup Senior Content Curator Ginny Meese. She, before coming to TechSoup, was a Senior Editor for PC World. and She's covered mobile devices and consumer advocacy issues in print and on websites. And She also blogs regularly for TechSoup and curates content from around the web that involves bringing together technology resources from uh, you know, news sources that, are, that may be of interest to nonprofits and libraries. A look at today's agenda. We'll do an introduction of TechSoup. And then we want to hear from you. What are your predictions before we even get started? What things do you think are coming on the horizon in 2015? And then we'll hear from Jim who will talk about electronics encryption, the economy, and some more. Uh, we'll hear about Matt's predictions on how mobile is changing and what things to look out for. And then we'll hear from Ginny on deserters, drones, and disasters. I was all about alliteration putting this agenda together last night. We'll have time for Q&A toward the end. But really we do want to make this a conversation with you. You can chat with us through the chat window, and we'll share back out any interesting predictions that you put into the window. So feel free to do so throughout the webinar. And let's go ahead and get started. So TechSoup is a 501c3 nonprofit, and we're working toward the day when every nonprofit, library, and charity around the world has the technology, knowledge, and resources to work at their full potential. We do that, and we have been doing that since 1987, serving more than 200,000 charitable organizations in the U.S. and 60 other countries around the world. It's a little bit about us, and you can learn more at TechSoup.org. But to get us started with the topic of the day, here are a handful of things. I couldn't list out all the potential trends. I was limited to 10. Here are some that I think were just sort of fun to throw out there. What do you think are going to be the hottest trends in social good in 2015? And obviously, if there are things that aren't on this list that you'd like to talk about or like to hear more about, put them in the chat window or tell us what you think is coming up. Go ahead and click on any of these boxes that you think are relevant. Do you think Pinterest is really going to be the big social good change maker next year? Do you think the Internet of Everything is going to be even huger? Do you think privacy and encryption or how activists and democracy are using technology or activists are using technology to advance democracy? Are you thinking that broadband expansion into pockets everywhere around the world is going to be changing the game for social tech? What about wearable technologies? How about data? We hear that word a lot. What about drones? Will they be making a big change for social good? 3D printed kidneys, that's just an example. But do you think 3D printers are going to be changing how we deliver services to our community? And what about apps for sharing? So tell us what you think. We have a couple of people commenting in the chat window. We know you can't see that, but uh, Bruce comments, mini payments through phones. So that's interesting. And I think we will hear some about that later on in this webinar. We have some folks asking how the weather is here in San Francisco, and it is rainy. So let's see. Sean comments that privacy and encryption will be the biggest topic in 2015 with the recent light shed on all of these breaches of big-name companies. 
that is a very telling prediction that we may hear more about. Neil comments civic engagement. So great, we've got a lot of different ideas coming in. Just to show some of the results from how you have voted, people think privacy and encryption and data by, by and large are the big ones on this list of potential things that are going to be changing technology. Um, and we have a couple of questions asking, will we be talking about Internet.org initiatives? I'm not sure that we'll get there, but we may. I'm going to go ahead and flag it as a question, and we can see if we have time for our presenters to talk about it. So with that, I'd like to welcome our first presenter, Jim Lynch, TechSoup's very own, and one of my favorite TechSoupers, to the program to tell us a little bit about why we do these predictions and how we hope that this can help you plan for the future in your organization. Thanks for joining us, Jim. Thank you, Becky. Can you hear me okay? Loud and clear. You sound great. Okay. Terrific. Okay. Um, hi, everybody. Just wanted to tell you that uh, I just published on TechSoup our 2015 NP Tech Predictions. And um, the thing that I wrote about was essentially a poll that I took within TechSoup of our employees and our NetSquared community on what they see as looming large in 2015. Uh, actually, nobody wanted to talk about the Internet of Things or big data, so sorry about that. I don't think we're going to cover those things in this webinar today. But the things we did talk about were first, let me see if this works, we talked about cheaper consumer electronics. There it is. Um, so what I've been noticing, and this was one of my recommendations on what to really look for in 2015, we've had huge price drops in very cheap laptops, for instance, with names like the HP Streams and Acer Aspires and lots and lots of Chromebooks that are coming on the market that are $200 or less now. And these are, these are consumer-grade laptops, but they're full fu fully functioning. They do everything that any other laptop does. Like, for instance, the HP Stream is getting the most attention. It's a Windows 8. It's a fully blown Windows 8 laptop. It's a little more fragile than a commercial-grade piece of equipment, but uh, they're coming online like crazy. And what's gone on is that uh, the Windows laptops are basically competing in a downward spiral with the Chromebooks. That's what's going on in the world, it looks like. Tablet prices are dropping down like crazy. Sorry to say that it's not so much happening with Apple iPods, but a little bit. Microsoft services, Surfaces, which are terrific Windows, Windows 8 uh, kind of hybrid device between a laptop and a, and a tablet. And then the Samsung, Samsung Galaxy tabs. Those are premium ones. They're not dropping too much, but there are under $100 ones that are now coming in line, which are, are pretty great and getting good reviews. They include things like Kindle Fire, the Dell Venue, uh, Toshiba Excite, HP 7, Dell Streak. There's lots of them. And then you can actually get under $50 ones now. And they're made by companies like RCA, Polaroid, Digiland. You can get them at most of the electronics stores like Best Buy and Walmart and so on. Uh, one thing I, wanna, I found in researching the very, very cheap ones is that they, they tend to supply a bigger security risk if people bring them into the office. And I know my, my uh, co-presenter, Matt, is going to talk a little more about BYOD, but that's where these things come into play for nonprofit offices. That means that more and more people are going to bring in their own personal devices to do their work. And so it's just going to be more headaches for our IT teams in our offices. So moving on, I'm going to skip this next slide, which is uh, about, about amplifying social media. Let me see if I can get that next slide up. There we go. So what's going on with uh, security? Uh, that was the top vote getter in our little, in our little t 
tally that we did just before this webinar. And so this has been going on for a while, as you all know. The Edward Snowden leaks and all of the, the hacking of major sites like Target has been going on last year. It's been huge. I think the thing that I've been looking at that has been the big indicator on this is cyber insurance. Actually, there, companies can buy liability insurance for getting hacked nowadays. And this is a new industry that's only been around for about four years. In 2010, there was nothing going on. <laughs> it was not an industry, and now it's a $2 billion industry. And so it's had a 67% increase from last year to this year. And so it's just going to keep spiraling up this particular trend. Um, one thing that uh, my colleague Wes Holling expressed was that there, one new thing to look out for is the Electronic Frontier Foundation's new program called Let's Encrypt. And that's a project to encourage everyone to make all of their web pages secure. That means trans transpose all of your web pages, every single one, to being HTTPS, or secure web pages, which basically will improve the entire web kind of ecosystem. So that's, that's a big trend that we're seeing coming up. So what's next? Nonprofit sharing economy. So if you don't know what that is, the sharing economy is a kind of a new thing, mm, a new spin on an old thing, let me say that. So it's been around a long time. Uh, although the, what's being called the sharing economy with things like Uber, which is a car sharing service, or Airbnb is a great example of people sharing rooms in their homes, has come about within the last few years uh, because it's applying mobile apps and simple-to-use online kind of matching services to this sharing of goods and services out there. So that's the new part of it. Um, sharing has been around for a, quite a good long time. A, a great example of that are the time banks that have been going on since, uh, let me wait, let me wait, since 1832. 18 <laughs> Actually, it's a, it's a thing which uh, is a labor sharing exchange. And uh, <laughs> so that part of the sharing economy has been going a very, very long time. And there's a new version of that called time banks. That's a nonprofit organization that basically uh, allows people to pay it forward in log, you know, doing something for somebody else, and then they get one unit of labor credit to get labor from somebody else. So that's, that's an interesting thing that I would look forward to in the coming year. Uh, there's lots of nonprofit activity in this. Uh, it started out as a, as a commercial thing in this newest version of the sharing economy. Um, I mentioned the Uber Goodwill Partnership in New York City, and that's a deal where uh, people have lots of clothes to donate. Uber drivers would be willing to pick them up and take them to a Goodwill, and so there's a kind of a nonprofit private partnership going on there, which looks like it's a trend. We're hoping it is. And then there are nonprofit car sharing programs like city car share and bike sharing programs like Denver bike sharing that are taking off and doing well. Um, I mentioned a couple other things on this. Uh, Peers is a nonprofit work sharing exchange and they have a great list of all of the different sharing economy things that are going on on their site. And then um, Collaborative Lab is a consulting place that is involved with something called shareable cities. So several cities around the country now are actually encouraging the sharing economy movement around the country. So it looks like that's taking off and something to look forward to. And one other thing I wanted to mention on the sharing economy was uh, an organization called shareable.net. And that's a thing where nonprofits um, basically do advocacy in and around this. And the 
kind of chief spokesperson for this field is Neil Gorenflo at shareable.net. That's a pretty interesting thing that I'm watching this coming year. All right, so that's, that's what I've got on shareable economy. What's next is mobile payments. Mobile payments has been quite possibly uh, revolutionized by the launch of Apple Pay. So Apple Pay is a one-click app. That means you can pay for something on your smartphone with one click, which is a big deal because prior to this, it was a big hassle to pay for things on a smartphone, especially making uh, charity donations. You had to put in a whole bunch of information and go through a lot of rigmarole to be able to make a donation. Uh, and Apple Pay has basically revolutionized that. Some uh, indicators on that is that Apple Pay launched on October 20th, just a few weeks ago, and after one week, it had basically exceeded all the activity on all the rest of the um, smartphone wallet services. These are things like PayPal mobile payments, uh, Intuit Go payment, Square Wallet, Amazon Payments, you know, you get the idea. Those kind of things. There are a lot of them out there. Apple, within one week, had basically exceeded all of them put together. And so I would expect that this is a thing worth watching, mainly because this will probably make online, or rather, uh, donating, uh, donating on mobile phones happen, finally. Whereas before it's been sort of a I don't know, under the radar kind of thing, it's going to go above the radar, I would say, in 2015. So next, charity crowdfunding. This, was, this is actually something that's been taking off more and more and more and more. Charities are basically putting uh, funding requests up on sites like uh, crowdsourcing sites like Indiegogo and Kickstarter. And uh, there have been some crazy things going out in the world, in and around uh, crowdfunding. And, of course, the most successful one this past year has been the Ice Bucket Challenge from the ALS Foundation. And then the, most, the weirdest one was Zach Brown's Potato Salad Project. Um, that's a guy in Ohio who basically put up a thing that said, basically, I'm just making potato salad. I haven't decided what kind yet, and he raised $55,000 from people who thought that was cute and who gave him money. There's also a service called GoFundMe, which has crazy stuff on it, like someone uh, asking for money to, for gas money to attend a music event and all kinds of other strange things. So in my piece that I wrote, I'm uh, describing this trend as crazy and in the in the manner of pet rock crazy <laughs> from the 70s. So the last trend I want to maybe predict, I don't really know if this is going to happen, but with all the sound and fury of Internet and crowdfunding and mobile payments and all of that kind of stuff, we're actually seeing some movement toward people unhooking and getting away from the Internet and turning off all their things. An example of that is a California-based place called Digital Detox, where they give people refuge from being online all the time. I don't know about in your city or your town or wherever you are, but we have people in San Francisco walking around completely in their devices and bumping into things. People never get out of their devices. They just are on them all the time. So. That may be a trend, maybe not. Who knows? So, Becky, back to you. Who's next? Thank you, Jim. Interesting stuff. I actually had that inclination a couple of weeks ago to um, deactivate my Facebook, which I've been on it since 2006, and so that was a scary thought, but also sounded so relieving to do that. So I'm sure that other people have had those similar feelings at times uh, in their social media and in their devices that they're just too hooked on it. So that's interesting. I, I would love to go to Camp Grounded in the Redwoods and disconnect. Um, let's go ahead and have Matt come on and talk a little bit because I think he's going to talk a little bit about some of this device stuff and, uh, and a little bit of our addiction to our devices and 
some of the benefits of that with being able to bring your own device, and also some of the drawbacks of maybe being, how much we're using them. So welcome to the program, Matt. We're so glad to have you join us. Thanks, Becky. How's my sound? Coming through all right? Yep, you sound great. Okay, great. Well, hello, everybody, and uh, thanks for tuning in today. Really excited to share with you some of, uh, some of what we're seeing and uh, definitely will dovetail onto a few of the things that, uh, that Jim was talking about, but uh, just sort of a preamble to this. Uh, I know we have folks from not just in the U.S., but from other parts of the world and a you know, good por portion of the content is not necessarily specific that I have to talk about. It's not necessarily s specific for the U.S. market, but it's a little bit angled that way just for some of the dynamics going on around BYOD and, and the, the mobile market and so on. But, but a fair amount of it is sort of universal as well. And, uh, but please, if, if we're not covering something, please you know, chat it out and We'll try and get to it at the end or in the follow-up that we're doing to, the, uh, to this webinar in the next few days. So a caveat I'll place is that, you know, just to kind of level set, right? So there were, there were really no mobile phones till, uh, till probably the late 80s out in the commercial use. And funny, I was talking to somebody about this yesterday. As of 2006, there were really only a quarter million smartphones out there. The iPhone had not been quite released or Blackberry. So... It's only been set, you know, this whole craze is like seven years, and then the whole market's only like 25 years old, you know. So, so it's kind of interesting when you think about that um, and all the amazing progress and how fast it's taken over. You know, there's over a billion smartphones now on the planet, expect to be 5 billion by 2020. So it's a work in progress. It's still fairly young, and BYOD is evidence of that. You know, it's one of these things that's gotten out ahead of itself uh, in terms of the market being able to really address it. And uh, I lost my, there we go. So the BYOD uh, really is, is in a reactive mode. About 75 to 80%, at least in the U.S., uh, of, of workers are, are bringing their own device to some, uh, to some degree, and the, the policies are pretty reactive. And I think the, the key from the take, the takeaway from, from this slide and what we're seeing here is, you know, to start getting more proactive in terms of taking advantage of this dynamic and the potential cost savings, the increase in productivity. And uh, we did an earlier webinar, if you go and search the archives, that really details strategies around BYOD and sort of how to, how to uh, stage one of these in your own organization. Uh, it's not going away. It, it's sort of probably becoming more the norm than the exception. And there's a lot of reasons for that, but uh, it's just it's more of a distributed kind of load off of the uh, off the workforce. So then it's more uh, mo more productive at the same time. So the canary in the coal mine here is the, uh, the California courts that I'm sure a lot of you've seen this that um, you know called for organizations to start reimbursing their employees for BYOD phones and so on. And this is being challenged, and it's going to take a little while to sort itself out in the courts, but it's definitely something to pay attention to that this is, there's going to be probably policies coming to address this. Uh, some, of the, some of the trends that, that we're seeing uh, really here just pointing out kind of how on that we really are and have become, you know, the idea of uh, smartphone users checking their email within 15 minutes of waking up, 79%. Uh, without their smartphone for two hours a day. And to sort of tag on that, we've actually started a, a, trying to start a little movement. We're calling it uh, Phoneless Friday. So if you just do hashtag Phoneless Friday and check it out, we're starting to, to try and get folks to start being aware of how much they're on their phones and to start, you know, kind of uh, ramping down that usage or see how hard it is really. And then, uh, you know, more portability, tablets starting to outsell laptops, and, and uh, the cost savings from all this. And uh, That's a funny comment, though, just to jump in there, Matt, about the Phoneless Friday thing, that how do you tweet that with the hashtag if you're not on a device that's already connected? <laughs> you know, it's kind of that how do you disconnect while still being connected. 
Yeah, yeah. It's just it, it's really more of an awareness campaign that we're that we're doing, and it's uh, around our mobile for all uh, campaign that I'll, I'll I'll mention a little bit uh, down sure. the road here. Um, so this is really the slide. I'll stay on for a, a, a minute or so or two. Uh, there's a lot of things that are happening, a lot of intersections. Again, this market is young, and it's sort of been in a certain mode for a long time. And, and what, what we're seeing, so if you sort of look at next year and look at the years to come, you know, the idea of voice and text and data, it's really a structural separation. You know, in, in five years, it's all just going to be a data stream, and you have a voice app, and you have a text app. And we already have those things, but the carriers really haven't adapted and moved towards more of that reality. So you can go on Skype or you can go on other apps that you can text via, you know, whatever, and kind of move away from that. But from a carrier standpoint, we really see this all kind of merging into a data, data stream. Um, another opportunity is around sponsored data. So we're seeing uh, the platforms now where if you go and use Yelp and Facebook and so on, that they're going to really sponsor your data usage. I, I think that's going to be a growing trend in the coming years, and there's already platforms to start automating that. And so that's a real interesting trend so that, you know, the Amazons of the world will pay you, basically pay your data usage while you're in their app or on the platform buying their stuff. And that's an opportunity for, for uh, nonprofits for sure, for cost savings and other elements. Um, wow, Jim said, you know, talking about the handset cost dropping, this is going to be really significant. You know, the days of six, seven hundred bucks for a for an iPhone or whatever, just they're holding on to that as long as they can. But you know, there's a new breed of cell phones or smartphones coming out that are going to be two, three hundred bucks for a new cell phone that has the same quality, uh, and it's going to even go down faster. So really expect to see that and this whole idea of device subsidies and the carriers using that as sort of their, you know, uh, enticement to come along, that that's going to get a lot less valued and probably go away. Uh, the switch to 4G LTE is a huge difference. That makes this, the smartphones, they finally, the carriers finally catch up to the smartphone market, right? So that's happening now. Unlocking phones, very common in Europe and other parts of the world, not in the U.S. It's just been enacted into law. So that's happening. So the device curve is also going way down, right? The new, quote, unquote, Samsungs or iPhones, are they really that much advanced or different than they were before? You know, are they going to be able to read your mind <laughs> next or what have you? Um, moving to remote work, this is just growing every, you know, we've had a ton of projects and things we've been involved with. Average of 4 to 5% per year over the last 25 years. Probably a third of uh, the workforce will be working mostly remote by the, the end of this decade, and it's just going to keep growing. It makes sense on so many fronts. So there's a lot of press out there, and I don't need to, to, uh, to go into that too much because I want to spend a, a, a few minutes on the last piece here, which is really the social impact and the opportunities and the nonprofits that are driving using mobile for social impact. And, uh, you know, a couple that I found in a recent uh, uh, I'll, I'll, the Nominet uh, Top 100, this uh, app, uh, Peak, which allows uh, folks, you know, uh, professional eye exams via your phone from remote places. And, uh, you know, the stats around that are pretty incredible of, of how many people will save their site. Uh, Mama is just, you know, totally inspirational, beautiful organization using mobile, putting mobile devices in, in, in mother's hands, uh, in women's hands, uh, you know, prenatal care, postnatal and uh, they're having an amazing success in, in Africa. I'll talk about a couple of our partners. Uh, one, World Reader, that uh, we, you know, they're providing, you know, essentially a, a few million uh, books have been read that wouldn't have been before, putting Kindles, mobile Kindles, in the classrooms and mostly sub-Saharan Africa, but they're in about 39 countries and uh, just doing amazing work and going to, schools that have no library and basically all of a sudden they have access to tens of, tens of thousands of books. Um, I'll also mention our uh, Mobile for All partnership while, while we're on that. Jim Lynch uh, just did a great post on TechSoup. Uh, it's mobile, the number four and all. Just search on that in TechSoup. And we're actually running an Indiegogo with our partner Community Technology Alliance right now to, uh, as Jim was talking about also. And so kind of real-world examples of these things that are going on, and that's really using mobile to help uh, end cycles of homelessness in the U.S. 
And um, and then so from a recommendation, oops, I jumped one ahead there. This uh, the Nominec Trust 100 that just came out. Make sure you check that out. It's just some of these examples I pulled from there. It's just an amazing number of stories that are really you know life changing. Uh, one of them is uh, 3D printing, which we mentioned earlier. And I'm, I'm running over a, a second here, but I'll, I'll wrap it up, Becky. The uh, uh, printing remote prosthetics in the field in Sudan, uh, it just, it's just life-changing and amazing. But make sure you check out that, that uh, list of 100 that was just, just came out. And uh, that is all I have. We're, we're definitely looking at bringing some of these things to the TechSoup platform, though, in the coming year. Uh, around mobile office, additional hardware donations, sponsored data, and all that. So, you know, please let us know. We're, we're on the, the TechSoup forums uh, in the mobile and wireless branch. We're having an event next week at uh, Thursday at noon. So we're just going to be pushing more and more info out and more and more benefit to the community. So thanks for, thanks for listening and your time and your comments. Thank you so much for that, Matt. And we know, you know, we're, we're – flying through stuff here with some of these predictions. So if you want to hear more detail about any of them or have questions about ones that we're not covering, definitely put those in the chat window and we can get to them in the Q&A. But next, I want to go ahead and transition us over to talk to Ginny Meese, our Senior Content Curator here at TechSoup, who really does a pretty broad observation and collection of content that's being shared both in the tech sector and in the nonprofit sector and library sector too. Uh, she helps manage our TechSoup for Libraries program for any librarians on the line, and um, you know, really gets a, a broad perspective of what's happening out there in all of those areas and brings them together to create content across our sites uh, every week. So we're excited to have her join and talk to us a little bit about some of her predictions. Thanks, Ginny. We're glad to have you. Hi, everybody. I'm excited to be here. Um, so I wanted to start by talking about um, a potential for a Facebook exodus in 2015. And I don't know if you've been covered or if you've been following some of the coverage on some of the controversies around Facebook, but it's kind of had a rough 2014, and it seems like this year was the first year that people started questioning their use of the social media giant. I mean, Becky already mentioned that she was considering deactivating her profile, and I've also had those thoughts as well. So I just wanted to go over some of the reasons why people might be moving away from Facebook in 2015. Um, starting out with some of Facebook's privacy flaws. Um, privacy has always been super confusing on Facebook. It's hard to figure out what you're sharing to whom, and plus they're always changing their private privacy policy. It seems like it's something different every single day. Um, and one thing I did want to mention was that there was controversy over Facebook's Messenger. It was a mandatory download for users who wish to receive messages on their phone. You had to download a separate app or else you were just not able to get these messages. And so I resisted for a long time because a report came out that Facebook was tracking your user data via Messenger, and it essentially had spyware that was made especially for surveillance. So being the sort of paranoid person that I am, um, I resisted downloading Messenger and missed a whole bunch of messages from people because I wasn't checking it on my computer. And so I, I think other people had similar distress over that. Um, so that was one hit against Facebook. Another one was when users were being reported for not having their real names associated with their accounts. And so accounts were being shut down, and people weren't allowed to log into their accounts that they had for years and years and years until they provided proof of their name. And from people that I talked to, this could be like your, you know, you'd have to send over a copy of your driver's license to Facebook admin or some sort of proof that you were, you know, this certain name. And that's really not cool. Um, it puts certain people at risk who choose to use a different name on social media out of personal safety, out of gender identity, or other personal reasons. And so there was a big, huge campaign against Facebook called the, called the hashtag My Name Is campaign. And this sparked many people to jump ship from Facebook, at least temporarily, until they changed this policy. And another big hit, and this affects all of us, is the sort of deluge of sponsored content in our feeds. I started to notice that a lot of the 
nonprofits or smaller businesses or causes that are swelling on Facebook just weren't showing up in my feed. And instead I'd get like a select few posts that were maybe, you know, from friends, but they were associated with something that was trending on Facebook or some sponsored content that had nothing to do with anything that I'm interested in. And I wasn't seeing, you know, the information that really mattered to me. And this is a problem that's widespread. And nonprofits were really taking the hit on this. Um, you know, you can buy sponsored content and have your posts be more visible, but not everybody, especially not nonprofits and public libraries, have the social media budget to do that. So as a result, organizations were having a hard time getting their content seen, and users like myself were getting frustrated with getting fed sponsored content from organizations that we – or not organizations, but businesses or celebrities that I didn't really care about following. Um, so in response to all of these issues, a few social networks started gaining popularity. And I'm just going to hit this next slide real quickly and show you some of these other ones. So, um, you know, a couple of other more specialized services were popping up like Ello and Snapchat and Ask FM. Um, and these especially gained popularity among younger people. I did a workshop with um, some teenagers, and when I asked them, what social media platforms they use, they didn't even consider Facebook in their wheelhouse of top social networks. So it, it kind of started to lose some traction in 2014. But my question is, is there going to be this mass exodus in 2015? And right now I'm thinking not yet. I think Facebook will still be top dog, but you know it's going to take some work. So. Uh, Facebook is trying to address some of these issues. And my big question is, will it be enough? So let's start with some of the problems that I, I covered in the, the earlier slide. So in terms of the privacy policy, Facebook has a brand new privacy policy starting January 1, 2015. So yes, yet another new privacy policy. But they're releasing a privacy basics tool that will walk you through the policy and give you various tips about, you know, who you're sharing, what content with, and how you can change those settings. But while Facebook is making this effort, I'm, I'm wondering what's going to happen with Messenger. People are still resisting downloading Messenger on their phone, and so is Facebook going to continue to make people use this separate app to receive messages? And moving on to the real names, that's still really a work in progress. Facebook did apologize for their real name policy, and they said they're going to ease up on deleting profiles for not using real names, but people are still getting reported, and people are still getting their profiles deactivated for not using their birth given name. And this could really continue to cause people to turn away from the site if they continue cracking down on this, you know, sort of, uh, I don't know, it's, it's kind of a shady, shady practice, I think, and it makes it kind of an unenjoyable place to be when your friends are getting just wiped out left and right because they don't want to use their real names. And next, with the, the sponsored content, so Facebook has said that it's going to scale back sponsored content in 2015. They actually published something on um, their Facebook news site. You can check it out. I can share the link after uh, I'm done with my presentation. But they, they're saying that you'll see more content from your friends and the pages you follow and the causes that you're passionate about. But you know, this really remains to be seen. They can promise this, but will this help nonprofits get their content seen? And how much is Facebook going to scale back on this? And obviously, Facebook needs to make money to function. So, you know, are they going to still have these sponsored posts? And how much are we going to see them? So that, you know, again, it's, it's sort of a question, um, how, you know, how is this going to affect end users? So finally, with these other social networks that are popping up, there really is no big threat to Facebook yet, and that's why I don't think that there's going to be a mass exodus quite yet. A lot of people signed up for, for Ello excuse me, <laughs> when it first came around, but it really hasn't gained much traction. I created an, ac an account right away, and I, you know, I used it for maybe a day, and then I sort of dropped off and just kept using Facebook because nobody else that I knew was on there. It's kind of a ghost town. And there's these niche, um, next, or niche networks like Nextdoor and Ask FM and Snapchat, but they're just they're too narrow right now, and you know they're not as broad as Facebook, and it's just it's not enough to overthrow this social networking giant. 
So moving on to a much different topic, we're going to talk about disaster relief and new technology. Um, so here in San Francisco, we're having a, our own little, not really disaster, but super you know, crazy storm or whatever. So I, I recognize the irony of talking about disaster prep during this. Um, but disaster prep preparedness is something that every nonprofit and public library really needs to be on top of, whether you deal with disaster relief directly or not. Sometimes the communities you serve might be affected by disaster, so there's a chance that your own organization could face some sort of disaster itself. So at TechSoup, we're constantly emphasizing the need for nonprofits and public libraries to have a backup plan for their technology in case disaster strikes. And I also think it's important to be up on the latest news and technology that is being used for disaster prep. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about what we might see in 2015 and beyond. So I, I made this short little list here um, on the slide, and so I, I put drones as the top one because I really think that this has the most potential. Personally, I find drones a little scary, um, and we definitely know the, some of the, the uh, I guess, scarier <laughs> use cases for them, but drones could actually have huge potential for food supply and first aid delivery in um, areas that are affected by disaster and might not be reachable by ground or you know by by larger vehicles. Um, another big one is 3D printing, and that's come up um, you know earlier in this in this webinar. And I really think that that's going to be a huge um, technology overall. But especially for disaster relief, it has a lot of potential. Um, you can manufacture supplies on demand like water filters or medical supplies like splints. In Haiti, um, they were using it to print umbilical clips at a clinic. And one of the things that Jim touched on earlier was the drop, price drop in consumer electronics. And I think that that's really going to affect 3D printers too. They're going to become more mainstream as the price goes down. Uh, biometrics, it, that's uh, like something like face or fingerprint recognition. Um, and a use for this might be like identifying people when their physical identifiers, like a driver's license or ID, is destroyed in disaster. And then finally, um, Oh, I did these out of order, I'm sorry. Uh, smart buildings, that's you know, technology in homes that can alert responders to different situations that might be happening in a home like a fire or a flood or a mudslide or something like that. So all these technologies have huge potential. And the Red Cross is actually holding uh, these tech workshops all over the world. And it's, it's a two-year initiative. And I actually had the honor of attending the one in San Francisco. And the idea is to come up with real solutions and plans using, emergent, or using these emerging technologies. And the Red Cross is actually going to turn these into um, pilots that they'll be able to use in real disasters. Um, so it's super interesting, and it's definitely something that um, you know, we should all be paying attention to. And the Red Cross actually has a blog called Tech for Resilience, Tech. Uh, and then the number four, resilience.blogspot.com. I'll share that URL in the chat. And um, Becky, I think we can include it in the notes. But it's a good way to just sort of stay on top of the um, technologies that they're exploring, the programs that they're piloting, and you know how we can become more resilient, tech, or more resilient communities with these emerging technologies in 2015 and beyond. Um, so that's pretty much it for me. Back to you, Becky. Terrific. Really interesting stuff. And you know, I just read um, recently that in Massachusetts they were able, or maybe it was at Stanford, I'm mixing up schools now, but they were able to 3D print a blood vessel. And so my, my post earlier, or my question earlier around 3D printed kidneys is sort of a joke, but it is on the track to getting there, which I think is pretty amazing to think you could print a kidney instead of having to be on a donor registry list for years waiting for one to become available that's a match. It's, it's kind of mind-blowing and incredible. Um, so feel free to chat your questions in to us. We have some here in the queue already, so I'll get to those. You know, before, Ginny, before I have you uh, mute yourself, we had a question and that's really, you know, on track with Facebook and, you know, the, the message that they've sent out that they are going to reduce some of the sponsored content or the way that it's in your feed. How do you see that impacting organizations, nonprofits, and libraries, and causes? 
that are trying to grow their audience on Facebook, do you think that the reduction in sponsored content will mean that those will actually get less uh, play on Facebook? Because now it's pretty clear now that it's pay to play at, with Facebook, that if you want to have a presence there and really be seen by your audience, that you almost need to be paying for sponsored content or to bump uh, or promote your content uh, with money. And that's something that most organizations, particularly smaller organizations, really lack. So how do you think that that will impact? Do you think it might help those organizations that are liked by their supporters get more attention, or do you think that it might actually harm them more? Well, I'm, it, it kind of remains to be seen. I mean, I don't know, you know, Facebook says that it's going to scale back sponsored content, but what does that mean? Like how much are they going to scale back? Um, they're, they're not very specific, and that's what concerns me. Um, so, you know, I, it, it's really hard to say. I, I, my hope is that less sponsored content, less advertisements mean that means that, you know, Nonprofits that have pages on Facebook will get more visibility, um, but it's just it's so hard to say with Facebook. I, I find that their algorithms and the, the way that they're constantly changing how they present content is really confusing and not as transparent as it could be. And I think they're trying, but it, it, it's still it's still really hard to predict. So it's just one of those things that kind of remains to be seen. Um, I don't think though in 2015 that. You know, if you're kind of on the fence about shelling out the money for sponsored content, I'd hold off on that for right now um, if you don't really have the budget for it because, you know, if, if the, the scaling back of sponsored content really does, you know, take effect, um, you know, you won't, need, you won't need to pay to play, I guess. It won't be as important. Right. That's a, that's a good tip. And, you know, I think the – term that people have been starting to hear more and more is that if you're, not the pro if you're not paying for it, then you're the product. And so as users of Facebook and consumers of uh, participating in networks that are privately owned, we are often the product. And our data that's collected there um, is the product that uh, is being shared and sold and marketed to companies that are using that information to better sell us stuff, which I think is what most of that sponsored content is it's not mostly, um, you know, for social good. Most of it is trying to sell us, you know, some product or another. So it's really interesting to watch kind of how that changes and how our interaction as individuals and communities with those tools uh, can feed into that data stream and how it's then used. Um, so to switch gears here a little bit. Uh, I wanted to have Jim or Matt, either of you guys might have a little more insight into this one. Uh, will, the Apple, will there be an Apple Play equivalent for Android? Do you know if that is in the works? Or do you think we can expect the ease of an Apple Play and that frictionless process of paying with a one-click device? Um, do you think that's coming to Android? Uh, this is Jim. Yes. Actually, there is an Android thing already out there, and everybody's moving quickly toward the one-click payment. I mean, really quickly toward the one-click payment. Apple is not going to be the only one. Absolutely, it's not going to be the only one. Uh, the Android version is called Android Pay, and um, I would say within within a year, all all of the you know mobile wallet services will have a one-click option. Great, and I, I imagine it would be interesting to see how that competes with, uh, you know, for example, the Red Cross and their mobile donations that they get through text messaging, which they kind of were the big uh, splash on the scene after Haiti and then after Japan in collecting, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars through those $10 text this code um, to make a $10 donation. Uh, and just wondering how these these pay devices or pay apps are going to be changing SMS donations and whether that will impact our community, whether it's worth investing in it. We have a couple of other questions here. Oh, go ahead. This is, Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, this is Matt. Just real quick on that. I mean, the whole uh, foundation of the payments, you know, 
banking payment systems, et cetera, you know, it's one of these cases where definitely some, some countries, uh, you know, when you look at M-Pesa and you look at, you know, a third of America is on bank or has uh, uh, restricted banking and you don't have a sort of uh, mainstream uh, facility here to address that. But, uh, you know, there are countries in Africa where 60, 70% of the population is using M-Pesa uh, on a regular or semi-regular basis. So it, it, this stuff's, you know, another, more examples of the automation of payments and, and banking will come behind that and just sort of the foundations of the system changing. So it really makes sense to be up, you know, on what's going on there and how that can impact uh, nonprofits in a positive way in terms of donations because, it's only going to become easier and easier for folks to make that click, you know, to, to, to contribute and so on. So how do we, how do we, how do we stay out ahead of that? Right. And how do I prevent my toddler from doing it left and right? <laughs> yeah, Bruce actually yeah. makes a, an interesting comment in the chat, um, you know, about how Apple pay is, you know, built for one company's product and Android is supported by many companies. So it may be longer to adopt due to having multiple platforms that will, They'll need to have this built for the HTC phones and the Samsungs and the everybody else who's got an Android device on their on their uh, on their product on their platform. Interesting stuff. Um, so we have a couple of other questions here. Kate asks, "Do you see many nonprofits making successful use with Tumblr?" And maybe Ginny, this would be a good one for you. You want to take a stab at that one? Sure. So um, yes, I mean I think. I think Tumblr, Tumblr is kind of an interesting one. Um, a lot of people feared that when Yahoo bought up Tumblr, it was going to change everything and it wasn't going to be, you know, the, the fun microblogging platform that it is. And it really hasn't changed. Yahoo has pretty much untouched it. Um, so I think it's still a very viable platform, especially for nonprofits and especially for doing cause awareness. Um, we've seen – a lot of great activism come out of Tumblr, and and I'll throw out um, Twitter as well has been a great platform for that. So, um, yeah, I think that nonprofits should definitely look into Tumblr, and um, you know, if if you're getting a lot of followers and you're getting a lot of reblogs and you're getting a lot of traction, stick with it. If not so much, don't invest as much time in it. It's it's sort of you know you got to look at what your community is using and what your community is talking about. And if Tumblr seems like the right place for it, then it's, you know, you should definitely go with it. But if you're not getting a lot of traction or readership from it, then maybe scale back on it. It's definitely worth trying though. Yeah, that's a great point. And I think that's the case with any new tool to really kind of look at where your community is at and if they're interested in it, using it, if they're already there, then it might be worth investing in. If not, then you might be talking to yourself, which is not going to help any of us, is it? <laughs> um, so another question here, and I think, Jim, I'd love it if you could take a stab at this one. And, and this one is kind of specific, so I'm going to broaden it a bit. But Carolyn was asking about Adobe software and sort of their monthly charge subscription versus an installed software package. And I think it speaks more to the, the broader question of the cloud. And if you could talk briefly about sort of what we're seeing with companies like Adobe and many, many others that are moving their traditional installed software and instead moving a lot of their products or potentially all of them into the cloud um, as we move forward. You know, Office with Microsoft is now Office Online apps and Office 365. So a lot of these companies are doing that. Do you have a, a thought or prediction around how much more of that we can expect to see, and whether we'll see some hybriding, hybridization of that where you can have both. What do you think? Oh, gosh. Which, you know, I did cover that in my, the piece I wrote on TechSoup.org, a little bit on hybrid cloud. Um, hybrid cloud means that part of your infrastructure is in the cloud, and it probably will be about uh, storing your data in the cloud in some way, because that's maybe the easiest and most prominent way, and certainly one of the cheapest ways. One of the trends that's happened in 2014 and will, will happen more in 2015 is what they call a race to the bottom on cloud storage. Cheaper, 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 always cheaper. Um, 
hybrid cloud is, uh, you know, you have some of your infrastructure in your office and some of it in the cloud. So we're expecting that trend. Uh, certainly we, we, uh, we got a recommendation on that from our, um, our partner in TechSoup Canada. So that's a big deal there. It's happening like crazy. Uh, on Adobe Creative Cloud, uh, Adobe is a TechSoup donor partner, and uh, we don't know exactly when, but we expect that Adobe uh, Creative Cloud will launch on TechSoup, hopefully in 2015. I'll make a bold prediction that it will launch. <laughs> and uh, the way it works is that Adobe software is going to be actually the same as it has been. It's actually a software that you download and you install on your computer just like you always did. In, in fact, it's sort of like an, an on-premises software. However, they, the way you, you pay for it is monthly. <clears throat> so in terms of nonprofits, we're seeing a race to the cloud really accelerating uh, from when we looked at it really in, in depth in 2012. Uh, the cloud is here to stay, and it's accelerating, and it's going to be a much bigger business. And eventually we expect that everybody will be operating in the cloud in some shape or, or form. And the big difference is in, in terms of cloud is you, it's basically renting software rather than buying software, as you probably know. You just pay for it on a monthly basis. Um, and we sure hope that all that privacy and encryption work that's being done <laughs> will make all of those things secure, as well as the, the mobile payments and one-click payment services that are developing. With that, we've got to go ahead and wrap it up. So thank you all for sharing your predictions, and thank you to the audience for sharing some of your own and asking great questions. Here are a couple of additional resources that might be of interest. I have a link in here to Jim's predictions blog post that has more, more areas than what we covered today. And we also have a link to Lucy Bernholz's Philanthropy Buzzwords for 2015 and her Blueprint 2015, which is a 36-page monster of a prediction document that you can look at that's really an interesting uh, look at how philanthropy and technology may be changing in the coming year. And then also a link to that Nominate Trust 100 list. Thank you so much everybody for joining us. We hope you'll join us again at one of our upcoming webinars. We have quite a few events happening before the end of the year. We have a webinar next week for libraries and how to build websites on a budget. We have following that a soup chat, which is a chat in our forums where you can get real-time answers to your questions about how to build and design websites for your nonprofit or library. Then we'll have a webinar on the 18th on how to get donations through TechSoup. So if you're new to us and want to know how to access the donation program, or you just need a refresher and some questions answered, join us for that. And immediately following that, we'll have Matt Bauer back on the line, uh, and not actually on the line, but in our forums for another live soup chat on mobile and social good. So if you have questions about the mobile topic and topics and where we're going with those in social good, join us for that. And then on the 23rd of December, that's the deadline for 2014 donation requests. And then all the way in January, for those of you joining us from libraries, we'll have a webinar just for you on how to get tech donations for your library. Thanks so much to Jim, Ginny, and Matt. And thank you also to Ali Bazdikian for helping on the back end managing those chat questions. Lastly, thank you to our, our webinar sponsor, ReadyTalk, for providing the use of this platform. We're using their ReadyTalk 500 tool, which is available in TechSoup's donation catalog. Thank you so much, everyone. Please take a moment to complete the post-event survey when the screen pops up so we can continue to improve our webinar program. Thank you so much everyone, and have a great day. Bye-bye.